Well, good evening. This evening, uh, as we begin, I'd like for us to read just a few verses from the text we're going to be in. So I'd invite you to go ahead and be turning to uh, Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. I'm going to go ahead and warn you uh, just a little bit that there's a, there's a little bit of unusual structure this evening. There's uh, typically when I preach, there's a pattern that I kind of jokingly follow that's normally, you know, the three points in a poem. And this evening, there, there aren't really points, but there is a poem. But I think a little bit of that has to do with uh, the uniqueness, uh, the unusual nature of the passage that we're going to be in. And to begin with this evening, I'd, I'd like for us to read just uh, the first five verses here of Genesis chapter 10. Now, these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog, and Mede and Javan and Tubal, and Meshech and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Repheth and Togomar. The sons of ja Javan or Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim and Dodanim. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone, according to his language, their families into their nations. Now, in some churches, it's very traditional that after reading a passage of Scripture or a portion of God's Word, the reader may say something like, may the Lord bless the reading of God's Word. In other words, what, what's happening is because there's not going to be further comment made on that particular text, or maybe in light of the fact that there's going to be comment on that particular text, there's a petition being offered that God will use His Word to accomplish a work in the heart of the hearer. To which, after spending quite a bit of time in this chapter in preparation and reading just a few of those verses, you have to wonder, all right, how does God use these verses like this? How does God bless the reading and the exposition of verses like, for instance, verse 25? Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, I, I, I plan on coming back specifically to that verse later, but I want to confess first just a, a few things to begin. In preparing for this week, I got to the stage where I'm essentially checking my work in commentaries. And I, I go to one that's just tremendously helpful and clear and faithful. And as I'm reading through it, I get to the portion where the author gives suggestions for developing the exposition. Basically, how to preach this text. And the very first sentence of that section says, There are not too many satisfying ways to treat this passage in an exposition. In other words, the commentator basically said, You've got your work cut out for you, bro which was both really frustrating and really encouraging. It was frustrating because it meant I wasn't going to get much help from him. But it was also encouraging because it meant that I hadn't missed something extremely obvious. Because, and, and this is the first confession, texts like this are difficult. And, and teaching through Nehemiah a few months back, we ran into a number of passages like this where it's just names. It, it's, it's just names, and they're not easy. You don't want to skip them. You don't want to miss anything there that's particularly helpful, but normally, meditating on the truth that the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Repheth and Togomar are, aren't going to be inspiring too many worshipful thoughts. But, and this is the second confession, texts like these are profitable. If you've been around here any length of time, you've probably heard us say, everyone wants to be biblical until they read it. And we've essentially made it a, a kind of motto around here. It's on our website. It's on other things, printed materials, that we want to be relentlessly biblical. And part and parcel with that is expositional preaching. And this commitment to exposition, exposing the text and presenting it, it's derived from and walks in tandem with the belief in the inerrancy, the total truthfulness and reliability of the Scripture. So when Paul writes to Timothy that all Scripture... Even the number of silver sockets in the tabernacle fence or the tribes descended from Mizraim is profitable to make it adequate and equipped for every good work. We believe it. And we have to practice that belief in preaching. But, and this is the third confession, even, even Pastor Calvin 460 years ago in teaching on this passage reminded his congregation that Paul elsewhere also wrote to Timothy not to be sucked in by those who want to dwell unedifyingly on endless genealogies. So, we're going to mine into this text because there's a wealth of edification here. 
but we're not going to go too far. We're going we're to be on guard that we don't enter into speculation, or, or I hope that we don't become tedious. But before I go any further, I do want to mention our big idea for this evening for our little listeners. It, it, it's the truth that we just sang about a moment ago. This is my father's world. This is my father's world. For our not-so-little listeners, I invite you to hold your place in Genesis 10. Turn quickly with me to Psalm 97. Psalm 97, and there in verse 1, you'll see a more biblically turned out phrase for our big idea. Psalm 97, verse 1. The Lord reigns. He's in charge. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. That's where we're headed this evening. That's what this text matters to us. Just like we sang a moment ago, this is my father's world. This is where this text is going in Genesis chapter 10. And I hope we'll see that's why it's in our copy of the word of God. Please don't make the mistake when you come to a text of scripture like this uh, of just passing briskly over it. Ask the question, do the work, come to others and say, I don't know what to do with this. Why is this here? And before we get into the specifics of seeing what this text teaches us about draining, in case you still are just a little skeptical of the value of of a text like this or list like this, I want to sketch just a few surface things for us to demonstrate its value. This same text, Genesis chapter 10, is going to be used by the author of 1 Chronicles as he records the generations that are going to lead into the line of Abraham, then the line of David, through whom the promised Messiah is going to come. This same list in Genesis chapter 10 and then recorded for us in 1 Chronicles chapter 1 is going to be used in Luke chapter 3 to point to, to legitimize, to demonstrate Christ is indeed, Jesus is indeed the Christ. What's more is that this list like this, it's unparalleled in the ancient world. C.S. Lewis, before he became a a, a believer, before he became one who was uh, uh, writing and speaking in defense of the, the legitimacy of Christianity, made the observation that as a professor of myth and mythology, he said, as I read the Bible, I realized myths don't work this way. They're not specific like this. They don't orient themselves in space and time. They don't give you geographical markers because they're relying on ambiguity. This is no mere myth, brothers and sisters. These are the records that real historical individuals are a part of the story. We know their names. We know their descendants. We know the extent of their lands in many cases. And there's a technical term that comes out in studying the Old Testament a lot that deals with some people's explanation of why these stories are there. The theory put out there by people who don't believe the scripture is that these stories are all fabrications, they're all fictions, they're made up to explain various things. Oh, there's a their name? Let's make a story about it. There's a ruined city? Let's make a story to explain how that got there. That term, etiological, when designated to a story means, well, it doesn't really have any basis in reality. Usually a a primitive people, they needed an explanation for why people are scattered everywhere, so they concocted a story about a tower and confusing the languages. Maybe you've heard stories like this, like Paul Bunyan dragging his axe and creating the Grand Canyon, or Rudyard Kipling explaining how the rhino got his skin. These stories, they, they tell you why an animal has a particular habit or why they have a particular geographical formation. The trouble with those stories is that everybody knows they're fictitious. Nobody takes them seriously. Moreover, they're not in accordance with reality. They have talking monkeys or giant blue oxen, but they're not grounded in truth. However, when we come to the, the scripture, when we come to the Bible, they have the ring of truth to them. They're not disconnected from reality. They're not mythic mythic in their scope or detail. So when we come to texts of scripture like this, one of the just minor purposes that they serve is to point us to the reality that 
These aren't ideological myths to explain where the Babylonians came from. These are written for a particular purpose. And one of the things that guards us in this is not disconnecting from what's happening when this is being written. Moses is first pinning this for the people of Israel. And throughout its history, Israel will look back at this book with an eye to understanding the world and itself. The same that we're doing here. So, what is this chapter doing? First audience, as they camp situated between the Hamitic descendants of Mizraim and Canaan, they're being taught something most important about Yahweh, their God. They're being taught and reminded this is indeed his world. He's not some tribal deity. He's not a territorial spirit. He's not restricted by a particular region or area. He's the sovereign of all the nations. He's Lord of all. The gods of the nations? Not so. I've talked about this before, but one of the most fascinating things about one of the favorite stories about Elijah calling down fire he goes to the top of Mount Carmel, the, the, the highest point of elevation in that region, to have this battle between Baal and Yahweh. And the one who is God will answer by fire. Do you know go there? Because Baal is the God of the high places. This is a home game. But again and again, Yahweh is going to demonstrate he's no mere tribal deity. He's not just the God of Israel. He's the Lord of all the earth. And recording the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, it's recording, among other things, the reality of God's blessing on Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They're the fathers of the rest of humanity. And if you remember, it was God who said they would go forth, multiply, and fill the earth. And this chapter is saying, yeah, that, that happened. What God commanded took place. as well as the fact if we were to draw a compass with Israel, the promised land at the center, and go north and circle west, we'd run into the descendants of Japheth. Then from the south, circling around the east and moving to the center, we find the sons of Ham. And intermixed with these and filling in the few spaces of the sons of Shem. But among those singled out of Shem, we have an abrupt stop. If you read through this chapter, there, there's sort of inconclusive data. It's going to be filled in in chapter 11, but for now, one of the major things being communicated is that the world was filled out by Noah's sons. That's why verses 1 and 32 say, these are the generations, the families, the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations. And out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. In other words, if you already know what's coming next in chapter 11, God has his purpose brought to pass. The people resisted the command, the, the mandate from God to fill out the earth. But God brings it to pass, despite the rebellion of men. And he's brought it so that at all points of the company of Noah. And this reminds us, beloved, God isn't kidding. He's going to bring about his purposes. For that first audience of Moses, having this recounted to them, it's drawing the picture very clearly. Their God, as he had declared and demonstrated to them, he, he's over Egypt. He's to be feared in all the earth. He's the Lord of all the nations. So when he singles out Israel and plucks them out from among the other nations and says, I'm going to, through you, accomplish my purposes, he reminds them in passages like Deuteronomy 7.7, the Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any of the people, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. In other words, just like we're told about our salvation in the New Testament, Israel was elect because of the great love of the Lord. Out of all the peoples of the earth, Israel is chosen because God loved to. And for you and I, who enjoy, his, who enjoy the relationship with the living God and the forgiveness of sins. Like Paul reminds his Corinthian readers in 1 Corinthians 1, it's not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. 
God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before the Lord. Beloved, we're no different. We're chosen in Christ, not based on our worthiness, but on his greatness. If anything, our weakness is our eligibility because God needs nothing and gets the most glory out of our infirmity. So Genesis 10 reminds us that in all of the wide world, it's not like anyone hoodwinked their way past a naive and narrow-minded God and slips in. He sees all nations, and more than that, he's sovereign over them all, and he reigns over them all. And in the midst of everything that we've seen so far in Genesis, over the, the time since we began a few years ago to when we picked back up at the end of chapter 8, the narrative is about to narrow drastically. So far, everything has been on a global scale, even when that is only two people. But it's about to get really, really focused. God isn't unaware or unconcerned for all the nations. Instead, they're merely put on a hold for a time. God will return to dealing specifically and salvifically with them in the future. But for the time being, as we go through Genesis, moving into chapter 11, chapter 12, he's going to work through one family through one line of one family, of one son, from all the nations of the earth, who, by the way, God set the bounds of their habitation. It's not like they just so happened to be in a particular region. Rather, God ordained and delivered it to be just as he willed. So the nation of Israel poised on the precipice of the promised land. They needed that reminder, and we do too. We need reminded that this is indeed my father's world. From the macro to the micro, God is accomplishing his purpose. So let's look at our text. Let's consider just a little bit how it's arranged. And like I said, I know that this is unusual, but we, we have to sort of mine through all of this to, to get where we're going. So how's our text arranged? Rather than work our way verse by verse through this chapter, I want to give us just sort of a working understanding of how it's laid out, because it's very specific, it's intentional. There are three sections in this chapter, each corresponding to, to one of them. In this layout, the ordering of the, the lines of Shem, Ham, and Japheth is pretty common in Genesis. The line that God is not working through, they're dealt with first. We'll see this later on as, as you have the generations of Ishmael going forward to then give space to tell the story of Isaac. So first, in verses 2 through 5, Japheth's line is given. We already read that. Then in verses 6 through 20, Ham's line is given. And in contrast to Japheth's line, more attention is paid to Ham's descendants for a number of reasons. You have, beginning in verse 6, this sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. Then you have, in verse 7, the sons of Cush. Then you have, beginning in verse number 13, Mizraim's sons. Then in verse 15, Canaan's sons. You have these lines that are singled out as let's follow their descendants. The reasons for that is first, they're, they're connected to Israel's story. There's going to be more interaction from Ham's line than Japheth's. After they move out and on, Israel won't have a lot of contact with them. Secondly, Ham's line is more geographically invested. Remember the land the people are bound for? We typically remember it as the promised land, but it's also referred to as the land of Canaan. And we'll come back to this, but the bounds of territory attributed to Canaan in verse 19, it's the first time a sketch of the promised land is mentioned in the book of Genesis. The, the land that Abraham will later be promised is laid out in Scripture there as the territory of Canaan. Finally, in verses 21 through 32, we have Shem's line. This is the line of promise, so it's saved for last. This is the one for Israel they want to know the most about. That's their line. And the line of Israel is essentially passed over for the time being. It'll be picked up in chapter 11 to detail others of this Shemitic people and where they settled. So, what can we learn from this? This is the breakdown of the chapter. This is how it's organized, what do we do with this? 
Well, first of all, like I already mentioned, it's, it's not myth. It's fact. It's highly constructed, well-organized, unparalleled fact. And one of the things that's remarkable is as you study through the book of Genesis, it's remarkable how often those who profess to believe the scripture, at least to the extent that they're writing a book on it, who maybe have spent years studying languages like Aramaic, Ugaritic, Sumerian, and they read pages of ancient documents. They're so ready to throw in the towel in the first 11 chapters of Genesis because there's no mention of Nimrod on anything that they found archaeologically yet. Or because a single slab of stone bearing an obviously mythological account of a founding city in an ancient dialect with a dead society, we trust that more than the scriptures. So clearly, the scriptures must be wrong. Beloved, we don't treat the first 11 chapters of God's word like he's just messing around. Like it's just sort of some ad hoc compilation of syncretism, blending myth and legend. But don't worry, we can believe the other parts later. No, beloved, this is, this is true. It's all true and it's all important. Now, again, it's difficult for us to connect with a lot of it for a number of reasons. One is that we're not great with geography in general. And some of the geography that's mentioned, specifically, we, we don't have a lot of information on it. But that doesn't mean true. It just means that our knowledge is incomplete, which, by the way, ought to throw us back in humility. We don't know everything. And we ought to guard against an attitude that would have us be wiser than the word. So we come to Genesis 10 and find all these people's names. And, and, and names that eventually become place names. If anything, it, it adds legitimacy to these stories. One of the things that, again, makes this difficult is the reality that a number of the names given are, are tribes, not individuals. For instance, in Japheth's line, the Kittim, the Dodadim, or in Ham's, the Kasluhim, and the Kaphtarim. These are the, the ones that end in the I am, the M is indicating a plural. It's a tribe, the people. Verse 13 is telling us that Mizraim, the Hebrew word for Egypt, an individual, he became the father of the Ludim, the Anamim, and the rest listed there. Something similar is happening with the Ites. You see them in the line of Canaan. The Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zimorites, the Hamathites. They're all people groups descended from Canaan, the man. And this was important, again, for the Israelites because they're about to go to a place and they know who they're up against. They're up against the Jebusites, the Girgashites, the Amorites. And they're about to dispossess them. They're about to take their lands and put them to the sword. And they need to know we're doing this because we've been commanded to by God. And this is the line with the curse all the way back in Genesis 9. When you begin to recognize these are the descendants of the line that was cursed, you recognize when Yahweh orders them to be Moses hundreds of years later, it's not arbitrary. It's in accordance with the long-term plan of God. Just in my initial study of this and taking notes and, and observations I wrote down it's just it's extraordinary that you can trace this territory in verse 19 to fit the boundaries given to Israel centuries later because it fulfills the Lord's word that Canaan would be the servant of servants one commentator put it this way the Canaanites are often viewed in the Pentateuch the first five books as the sinful nation who deserve God's wrath for their sins, the Canaanites lost their native land, so the text goes on to describe the boundaries of their territory, the first definition of the not yet promised land. Well, you might think, that's all good and well for them, but what do I do with Genesis 10? I, I, I hope maybe that you appreciate it. Okay, I've, I've learned some things, and I see it grouped in three parts, and, but I don't know how I can receive edification from this, how this is going to equip me for every good work Well, I want to draw our attention to just a few things. First of all, God is sovereign over all the nations, their dispersions, their cities, 
and their civilizations. It's one of the things that's given to us here in Genesis chapter 10. As you come to verse 5, after the listing of Japheth's descendants, you see, from these the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to their language, according to their families, into their nations. As you come to verse 20, these are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. You come down to verse 31. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. Later in the Pentateuch, Moses, just before he goes to the mountain where he's going to die, he teaches the people a song that's, that's to be a witness for them. It's, it's, in Genesis, or excuse me, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, you have the song of Moses that was going to be a witness to bring them to repentance and there to remember, according to verse 8, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. In other words, all of the details that we see here in Genesis chapter 10, it's not accidental, it's not incidental, or exclusively occidental. The Lord rules over the boundaries of the nations. He sets them. He establishes them. He separates them. No matter how much we think or attribute it to councils, wars, and treaties, they're merely the means by which his eternal purposes are connected to the cartographer. The same thing is repeated as I've already alluded to in the sermon to the, the, the Athenians in Acts chapter 17 where Paul proclaims, he, this God that they don't know, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Even in the little book of Amos, <coughs> Even in the little book of Amos, the Old Testament speaks <clears throat> about this when the Lord promises to bring the nations to account. It says, the Lord God of hosts, the one who touches the land so that it melts and all those who dwell in it mourn and all of it rises up the, that, like the Nile and subdues it like the, excuse me, and subsides like the Nile of Egypt. The one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome. He calls for the waters of the sea and he pours them on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. And this is what he has to say. Are you not as the sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel? Have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Arameans from Kerr? In other words, he's sovereign over all the migrations of the nations. He's supreme over the setting up of cities. So when Genesis 10 declares from the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, this wasn't just incidental happenings of people off on their own. It's according to the predetermined purpose of God to get glory for his name. Beloved, there are no chances. There are no accidents. There's only the purposes of God being played out according to his plan. Here in Genesis 10, God isn't merely recording events that he observed taking place from a, from a position of omniscience. He's wrecking deeds done by his hand. So that we would look at that, say the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, so that we would confess that this is my Father's world. We need not fear the fury of the nations. Like Isaiah reminds us there, as a drop from a bucket, and are regarded as the dust, a speck of dust on the scales. We don't need to worry about the direction of a nation or a city. We pray for its peace and prosperity under the grace of God, but we also see the grander picture. And we don't panic because we know he is the sovereign of civilizations. Beloved, Genesis 10 reminds us, teaches us, instructs us that he's sovereign all, over all the nations. Secondly, God sees and is involved in all the affairs of men from the opening of wombs to raising up nimrods. Now, realize, the only reason that Noah's sons could be fruitful and multiply is because God opened the womb of their wives. And we get distance from that reality, but, but actually as mentioned a few times in the book of Genesis alone. Most of us would go, yeah, children are indeed a heritage of the Lord, as the psalmist writes, but 
that also means he's the one who gives them. There could be no families of the earth, no nations, no peoples without the babies, and it's the Lord who creates life and fashions them in the womb. He opens the womb, and when, he, and when it fits his purposes, he's the one who closes it. For these people, the Lord blessed them with an abundance of offspring to accomplish his purpose. For his purpose, he gives and he takes away, and we would do well to praise him as Job, no matter how that disposes us. But it's not just in the matters of birth, the Lord is involved. Often, we're, we're fine to attributing the forming in the mother's womb to the infinite care that God takes in our lives. We're, we're fine with it. The Lord knits there in the womb. But what about the election? Or what about this crisis? What about this thing that's happening? What about this job opening? What about my supervisor? What about the need in my family? Look with me at verses 8 through 10. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. We'll continue reading on. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and rehoboth Ir and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. Now, there's a little bit of controversy concerning Nimrod, whether or not we can pinpoint him in history with any particular... And while that's unlikely, what we see at a minimum is that this guy didn't escape God's notice. In a list of somewhere around 70 names, he gets singled out. This idea of him being a mighty of the Lord most likely isn't a grand endorsement of Nimrod. In fact, it's likely the opposite. Nimrod is a rebel. He's the founder of the city of Babel. His name may even be derived from that title, rebel. And in his prowess as a hunter, something that the ancient Sumerians and Akkadian rulers to follow, they, they would pattern themselves after him. He exalts himself. The verses here indicate that he didn't likely begin these, all of these cities as much as he took them over. He's an empire builder and flying in the face of God's mandate to scatter and multiply. One pastor on this text says that Nimrod was great. Let us know that these things which appear great in the world today are not always approved by God, but displease him and are abomination to him. One commentator points out the difference between Nimrod and some other named men in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Nimrod, he's remembered for building cities like Cain, who's characterized as wicked in Genesis 5. And he's contrasted with righteous Noah and Abraham, who are remembered for building altars of worship to the Lord. Bottom line, Nimrod stands at the head of an empire that becomes associated from Genesis to Revelation with God-hating rebellion. That's some notoriety. It's one thing to be noticed. It's a whole other thing to be noticed for the right reason. Sure, Nimrod gets unique notice and elaboration in this list, unlike any other descendant. But at what cost to his soul? Let's not forget the grand lesson, the hard lesson learned by Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, where he's warned to recognize the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on him whom he wishes and sets it over the lowliest of men. Beloved, from the humblest birth to the highest throne, the Lord rules over them all. And whatever place we occupy in between, let's be content with his placement for us because he is sovereign over individual lives. Thirdly, God's program is not stymied or dependent on human deeds, particularly blessing the nations. We might be tempted to look at this here, and, and someone asked me, service. it seems like this is almost a little out of order. In Genesis chapter 11, if you haven't looked ahead yet, that's where the scattering of the nations happen. That's where they're dispersed from Babel. <clears throat> we might be tempted to look at what takes place here and, and, and just be mystified. Now, now there's barriers to people receiving the word of the arrival of the Messiah. They're, they're at the ends of the earth, 
and they speak a langu- another language. But as we see through the unfolding of God's word, scattering from one side of heaven to the, o- to the other doesn't slow down our Lord. He's going to bring blessing on all the nations in his own perfect timing. God scatters the nations in part to limit their ability to co-labor in rebellion against him. Then he singly operates through a particular family through whom he will bring the blessing to all the nations that he himself has dispersed across creation. Then he equips a people and empowers them and commands them to go forth and bring that nation, wait for it, to all the nations. To bring that message, to bring that word to all the peoples, to all the languages. Even for Israel, one commentator mentions, Israel would see the nations arranged around them and would better understand their mission and destiny by having this map. And beloved, how much more so for us? As we consider the task of world missions, of bringing the message of Christ to all points of the compass, might be tempted to grumble, to complain about the costs, the inconvenience, the struggles. This is the Lord's plan. It's his purpose. And we're guaranteed in his word of his success that some from all nations and people will be around the throne praising him. Beloved, this purpose of God is going forward. I want us to understand there's not an organism or an empire that springs into existence. Not a dog nor a dictator that has it today. There's not a star or a snowflake that's come into, into being without his intimate involvement. We're fashioned in the womb and our days are numbered like grass. We wither away and it's all under the constant, all-seeing eye and fashioning hand of the creator. A kingdom rises and a kingdom is ruined in all is according to the sovereign dictate of the Lord God Almighty. A president comes into power, a politician takes an office, a principal steps into a role, or a student slips into a seat, and all of it is down according to the providential purposes of our God. What's more, we have to continually minister this to our heart. This morning, as was already mentioned, maybe you've the text about it, the internet went down. And as a handful of us scrambled around campus trying to figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to handle this, and as I hadn't had my coffee yet, and I'm struggling against the natural man, rolling onto campus going, what in the world? And having to remind myself, this is my father's world. God is sovereign even over these things. The Lord is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He reigns, let the earth rejoice. The king is on his throne, let the earth be silent before him. We cannot escape his hand, we cannot sway his kingdom, we cannot usurp his rule or overthrow his authority. He is the ruler of all and he will have his way. As we already said, though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Another hymn written by a German deacon in the 1600s reminds us, God is God. He sees and hears all our troubles, all our tears. Soul, forget not mid thy pains, God or all forever reigns. Fear not death nor Satan's thrusts. God defends who in him trusts. Soul, remember in thy pains, God or all forever reigns. For this life's long night of sadness, he will give us peace and gladness. Soul, remember in thy pains, God or all.